yeah, it definitely is not something that you should have to deal with all the time or be dealing with all the time. There is a solution. It's just a matter of figuring out what specifically for you is causing those problems. Hello and welcome to the Eat More Carbs podcast. I'm Jenna Fisher here with Riley Beatty. Today we are joined by Maddie Alm. Thank you so much, Maddie, for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, you guys. I'm excited to be here. We are so happy that you're on the podcast today. I know we have a bunch of questions that we're very, very excited to ask you. Yes, I can't wait. Maddie, I know that you and I go far back, I could say. We do. (laughs) Which is crazy. We went to San Diego State together when we were both Mm -hmm. trained to become dietitians, which feels like 10 years ago. I know. Which is wild. (laughs) Um, Look at us now. I know. Here we are. (laughs) I would love, though, for you to introduce yourself, maybe share a little bit about your background um, as a dietitian, but then also as a professional athlete with our listeners and the athletes who are tuning in. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, my name's Maddie. I live in Colorado. I'm born and raised in Colorado. I went to the University of Colorado where I was a walk-on to the cross-country and track team. And that was kind of my introduction to nutrition. I actually worked with a dietitian there myself and saw some really major performance changes and was kind of like, why didn't I know about any of this earlier? I didn't even know that dietitian was a career. I'd never heard that term before. didn't know that was a thing. And I was currently on like the pre-med and psychology track. Um, I did five years because of running. So I did the double major. And then I was like, oh, I want to go on to be a dietitian. And so, you know, of course that experience was a lot more um, involved than I thought it was going to be, but I was really, really great. I got to do my master's at San Diego state which is where I met Riley we actually did a fun group project together (laughs) at one point and then I went on to do my like internship at Lipscomb University in Nashville and now I have my own practice called Fueling Forward where I work with endurance based athletes and then myself I'm still training and competing at a high level I've competed in four U.S. championships including the Olympic trials in 2021 and I have the goal of competing in this upcoming Olympic trials in 2024. I remember you said 2021 championships right? Yeah Mm -hmm. it was supposed to be 2020 but COVID. Yep, I yeah. remember watching you on my TV. I remember, oh my gosh, I know her. Yeah, oh, that's was, so fun. Where was it? Was in it? Eugene. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for watching. <laughs> what are you hoping to qualify in? So in 2021, I ran in the 5K. This coming year, I'm going to try for the 10K and 5K. Yeah. Well, we look forward to cheering you on. Thank you. If you're new to our podcast, we do a high and low segment where we share a little bit about what's going on with us personally. So high part of our week is what's going really well. Low part of our week is maybe what we wish had gone a little bit differently. Differently. Riley, do you want to kick us off today? I'll start with my low. I usually start with my high, but we'll start with the low this week. We're kind of like a sports podcast at this point because we do talk about fantasy football a lot of the time. <laughs> um, so I have to bring it up this week because my low for these past couple weeks has been Joe Burrow. I'm just very upset because I drafted him very high. He was like my QB1. And I guess a little backstory is we do play like a family fantasy football, so it's not like super serious or anything. I'm the person that takes it the most serious of anybody in the family. But I have drafted Joe Burrow, and my boy Joe Burrow has been, like, on and off. Last week, he had, like, 25 points, but he was on my bench because I had to bench him. I was super excited, so I played him. He got 10 points. I was not happy. Joe Burrow is a consistent low within our little mini sports podcast. (laughs) How's the rest of your fantasy team doing? We're okay. We're not bad. Again, I just, I care. I'm just super competitive, so I'm pretty sure I'm the person that cares the most. But hey, it's fun, and it makes football, like, watching football so much more interesting. So, like, when games are on and, like, I don't really care too much, at least I can, like, cheer on, like, random players and different things like that. So it makes it fun. But now I've, like, invested and I care, and now I'm upset about it, so how it goes <laughs> i'm sorry about joe it's okay i'm sorry for the city of cincinnati because there was a lot of hope there but mm-hmm. maybe 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 he'll come around what about your high what's your good part of your week my high is we've been working really hard at rbsn i mean we're all in private practice here it's hard sometimes so i've been super tired and on friday i actually like fell asleep after work I have a little bed in my office not for like taking naps, but just because that's how our house is set up. It was really nice because I woke up and Robbie had gone and gotten pizza without like asking. I don't know. It was just like a really, really sweet gesture because again, I was super tired. I was asleep and he just like was like, hey, we need to go get dinner. I'm going to go get pizza. So he got pizza and brought it home and woke me up and there's pizza. 
And that was really sweet of him. He's the best. He has made up for going to Disneyland without me. Maddie, what about you? Do you have a high and low from the week? Um, I can relate to Riley with my low CU football. I mean, goes without saying, we've been having a tough go here the past few weeks. Friday was tough. We lost to Stanford in double overtime after being up 29-0 and at the half. So that was a little brutal. Still believe in prime. It's fine. I'm hanging in there. And then my high, let's see. I'm working on a new program, which is something I'm really excited about about so that's been really fun and then I love training in the fall weather here in Colorado it's like beautiful normally it's nice and cool today's 85 but normally it's been like 60s I and mean, it's beautiful All the trees are changing so that's always one of my favorite times of year to go on my runs this time of year in Colorado is fantastic with like all the aspens changing and you yeah. get all that beautiful gold oh yeah, the it's the best. I know. It's so nice. I will wrap up our high and low section. My high for the week, my husband and I's wedding photographer was in Arizona to take pictures of somebody in Arizona's wedding, which was kind of crazy, but we got to meet up with her and her husband and they're the most like Aww. genuinely like sweet, kind people ever. And I think we sat down and had lunch for like three hours with them. So it was just so wonderful to like catch up with friends. They're just the best kind of people. So that was definitely a high was getting to see people that we hadn't seen in a little bit of time. And then my low for the week, also involves my husband. I got Envy Apples from Trader Joe's. I love Envy Apples. They're my favorite. And he was helping me unload the groceries, trying to be really kind and was like, oh, do you want me to put these in the fridge? And I was like, yes. And he grabs them and to try to like be impressive or cool or whatever he was trying to be. I'm not really sure. He like tried to juggle them and he can juggle. He can juggle. <laughs> But he juggled them and dropped them all on the floor. Oh, no. <laughs> They're all bruised and like kind of cut open and stuff like that. And he felt so bad. But I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> the best intention. Don't oh. juggle your apples. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially no like if they're your wife's favorite ones. <laughs> I can see him do like I can just see him being so excited to be like, look what I want to do. Yeah. It's an easy picture. Oh, Nolan. Love it. Well, awesome. Maddie, we're super excited that you're on. I think you're going to provide so much value from, again, a sports dietitian perspective, but then also as an athlete. And we're really excited to have you help us answer some questions that athletes submit and some of the questions that we're hearing from the clients that we work with on a daily basis. Awesome. I'm excited to hear the questions. Our first question actually talks a little bit about like your career. So how did you become interested in competitive running? And how did your journey to become a registered dietitian intersect with your running career? You kind of touched on that already, but can you kind of expand on that? Yeah. So it's actually really funny. I was a soccer player all the way until my junior year of high school when I realized that I don't think I was actually that good at soccer. I was just faster than everybody and I could outrun everybody. And so I went out for cross country and I really like did not take it seriously. I actually really didn't like running. I always told like my dad was trying to get me to get into running a lot earlier and I was always like, if I'm not chasing a ball, what's the point? Like, this just doesn't seem fun to me. So I went to summer running, which is like our training in the summer, maybe like four times. And then, you know, we had our time trial and this kid, Andrew Commander, was like, you'll never make varsity. It's really hard to make varsity. There's like, you know, 80 kids on the team and only seven make varsity. And I was like, okay, I'm going to prove him wrong. And so I actually made varsity in my first race, which is really exciting. And I was like hooked right away. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Because another thing like with soccer, you have to go through tryouts. And it was always, you know, kind of a political thing with like, if you're in the right club with the right coaches, you made the varsity team. If not, you're on JV. And that was always tough. So with running, I was like, this is really cool. If I put in the work and I run the time, I get the spot. And that's what determines it. So I love that like what I put into it is what I got out of it. So that was kind of how I got into running. We had a pretty good team throughout my junior and senior year. And then the next step on my other teammates were taking was running in college. And that was something I didn't really know if I wanted to do or commit to. I felt like I kind of had to because everyone else was. And so I actually was initially an invited walk-on to see you where they hold a spot for you, but you don't have a scholarship. I ran for a week and then I actually quit <laughs> because I hated it. I was like this is so miserable. I had no friends. I didn't realize like CU for anyone who doesn't know, they have like a powerhouse cross country team. Like they are consistently top 10 in the nation every year. Very, very competitive. And so my first run, I just got left in the dust and like walked back to my dorm and I was like, this is not for me. So quit the team, had a normal freshman year. <laughs> and then I was like, you know, I kind of miss running. I think I'm going to go back. And my mom's like, 
are you, are you sure you really didn't like it? And I was like, no, I think I want to try it again. So I emailed the coach. He was like, you know, run this time at our time trial in the fall. And if you do, you can join the team again. So I did it, joined the team. Initially, right off the bat, slowest on the team by far. Like really just running by myself in workouts. I was a 1500 runner, so just about a mile. I ran like 515 my sophomore year. And I just remember like I was always tired. I had some low iron stuff going on. I had like chronic shin splints that turned into a stress fracture, you know, things like that that were really frustrating. And I felt like I was just working really hard and not seeing the results. So when they hired a dietitian my junior year, I was like, huh, nutrition, I've never thought about this before. So I went in to see her and we started with having a chocolate milk between my run and our lift. And normally we have like these big workouts, we go straight to the weight room and I could like barely pick up the weights and then I'd have to bike back home and you live on what's called the hill. So it's an uphill bike home. And I just remember like barely being able to keep my bike upright. I was so tired and I was like, man, trained hard today like that's what happens and I started having a chocolate milk and all of a sudden I was like alive like I could lift heavier I could bike home and I was fine and I was like whoa this is this is different um so I started like gaining more muscle getting stronger getting faster and I went from running 515 my sophomore year and I actually became an all-american and ran 413 my fifth year which is a big drop for that short of a distance so that was super cool. That's kind of how I got into nutrition was me personally making the changes and being like, wow, this makes a huge difference. So that's kind of how I got into both running and then also into nutrition. I literally just got chills. I know. <laughs> when you just shared that, I literally <laughs> just got chills. Oh, that's awesome. That awesome. <laughs> I think one of the really cool points that you mentioned there, and we actually had an athlete on one of our previous podcasts talk about how she started to go through her nutrition journey and she was able to realize okay, I'm tired because I'm under fueling or my nutrition isn't correct or I'm tired from my workout or like not being fit. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens a lot of the time is people just assume I'm tired because I just trained hard. Yes. I'm a college athlete. I'm a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. I just train for four or five hours. That's why I'm tired, not mm -hmm. because there's a nutritional problem going on. Totally. And especially with running, because like we do our, we would do our long runs on Sunday mornings. So I would get up early, do my long run and then like be on the couch the rest of the day. And I'm like, oh, it's because of my long run. And now I know that like when I feel well, I can be a normal person the rest of the day. I can still like go meet friends for happy hour. Like I can still live my life and get things done and not be down for the count just from my run. Which is so important because you're not just an athlete. Exactly. Too. <laughs> and we want all those things that are happening outside of the sport to continue happening. And it's also really important for our mental health too. Yes. Absolutely. Something that you mentioned and something that we actually talk a lot about on this podcast is chocolate milk. So I would love to hear like your take on it as I guess a dietitian and a runner because the big thing that we're often hearing is it has too much sugar. So what's your take? What's your um, opinion on that? Totally. Well, I had chocolate milk earlier today. I pretty much have chocolate milk every day. So I love it personally. I think as a runner, it's nice because a lot of times right after a run, I don't feel super hungry. Um, or I go straight from a run to a lift and I'm not really able to eat like a full meal, but I need to have something that has carbs and protein and it's just like the perfect thing. It's low cost. I don't have to pay a bunch of money for all like the drink mixes, which I do have those and sometimes I'll use them. But honestly, I think just a good old glass of chocolate milk tastes the best. And then what I normally tell my athletes is like, yes, it has sugar, but that sugar is serving a purpose. When your insulin spikes right after training, that actually helps you store muscle glycogen more effectively. So it's serving a purpose. The sugar is not causing inflammation. It's not something that you need to be worried about. It's actually a great tool for athletes to replenish. The reason that like we're recommending it is the sugar. Like we want, yes, we want the sugar. The sugar, <laughs> the sugar is good. <laughs> yes. So kind of on that, like navigating that pre and post run fueling, I think one of the most stressful things for runners is kind of matching their nutrition, depending on like their training load, depending on if it's a longer run day, if it's a shorter run day, if they're preparing mm -hmm. for, you know, a big event. What are some of your tips for those individuals who are navigating that? Yeah, I think my first tip is that you should fuel before 
every single run. I think a lot of runners are like, oh, today's an easy day. I don't need to fuel. But, you know, a lot of like collegiate and beyond athletes were running 50, 60, 70, 80 miles a week. So easy runs are still a significant amount of time on your feet. And you're also fueling for the next day. So typically the day after an easy run, you have a hard run. And if you're going into that run already depleted, you run hard, you're depleted further, chances are you're not really going to be able to make up for that. And then the next day is typically when you'll feel that. And then, of course, over the course of a training block, when you're training every day, those things matter. How quickly you bounce back from runs and how quickly you're ready for the next one make a big difference in being ready for a race. So fueling before every run is kind of like my number one across the board suggestion. I also recognize that with runners, there's a special consideration for GI issues. I hear this all the time, like something's going to hurt my stomach. And unless you're eating like a salad right before your run, which I do see that a lot, unfortunately, with like lunches, but typically just figuring out what works for you is going to be the best move. Something that your teammates doing might not work well for you, but one of the biggest causes of stomach issues on runs is under fueling. So not fueling before your run can kind of feed into that and make it worse. And what I tend to see with my athletes when I encourage them to start eating before runs, stomach issues actually get better. So that's something that I would recommend. And again, if you're not used to that, you can start small. You know, if you have like less than an hour before your run, you can do something like fruit snacks or honey stinger waffles. Those are probably one of my favorites. Quick things like that. For me personally, I love toast before I run. So I do two pieces of toast and then easy days. I do butter and jam just because I really like that longer run or hard run days I do peanut butter and honey just to get more in it's actually not my favorite I think I've overdone it on the toast with peanut butter but I do it on my hard days just to get more and then easy run days I'll do like butter and jam or something like that I think that was such a great point because on our rest days or our easier days a lot of the times athletes think that they this is the day that they have to restrict Mm -hmm. this is the day we can't have foods that we enjoy this is a day that we have to only eat salads Mm -hmm. like that but you actually have the flexibility to incorporate more fun foods or how jenna calls it like soul feeding foods Mm -hmm. because you again don't have as high of a training load yes totally i love it yeah i love it i know it's nice you get all the variety (laughs) so for those runners right who are really worried about gi because let's be real that's what everybody's talking about it's a thing Mm -hmm. it is definitely (laughs) a thing do you find that like liquids before do better or solid foods especially for those athletes who are you know maybe like i can't even eat a fruit snack before so yeah what i would say to that is first of all i hear a lot of runners say like oh i have gi problems on runs but that's normal every every runner does I have not had GI problems on a run probably in five years, ever. Like, I had food poisoning one time. That was obviously a different story. But it is not normal. It's not something that you should be having to plan your routes based on bathrooms. I would say four of my clients this week were telling me that's what they do. And that's really stressful, especially if you're trying to meet friends to run or you have a workout with your team. That can cause a lot of stress. And stress can make GI issues worse. So I think, first of all, kind of finding, again, an approach that works for you. Um, Liquids are nice because it does help you with hydration before your run as well, which is another thing that can cause some GI issues. So normally what I kind of do with my athletes is start with trying to get some electrolytes in pre-run. That sometimes helps in and of itself reduce those GI issues. And if you can get electrolytes that have carbs, you know, like Gatorade or Scratch, Um, Those are really great ways just to get liquid carbs and hydration kind of all in one. That's definitely something you can try out. I would say the only challenge with that is sometimes if it's the first thing in the morning and you're drinking a ton, your stomach gets sloshy and that can be uncomfortable. So just having something small like some graham crackers to kind of like soak up some of the fluid so it's not sloshing too much, that can really help. But again, I would just encourage you to kind of play around with it. Don't try anything new on a workout day. A lot at stake there. I would say try new things on easy days. Just when you have more time, it's not as big of a deal if it doesn't go well. You know, you can try like the sports nutrition products out there like gels or chews or honey stinger waffles or you can try more whole foods like the graham crackers you know fig newtons toaster waffles things like that but just play around with it and see what works the best for you i would say i think that's such a good point because the term runner's gut is like there because everybody assumes that it is like a normal common thing yeah and for like to hear you say like that's not normal because so many people just assume that like oh it's just runner's gut right that's just normal 
Yeah, totally. And it can be so stressful too. Yes. Especially when you talked about like planning your routes or, you know, I mean, you're a professional runner. Like you can't stop to go to the bathroom. Right. Totally. Like middle of a race. I'm on a track. I do 5K, 10K on a track. Not going to be able to stop. And usually they're night races, which can be even worse sometimes for GI things. So yeah, it definitely is not something that you should have to deal with all the time or be dealing with all the time. There is a solution It's just a matter of figuring out what specifically for you is causing those problems. Yes. And you talked about night races. And I've seen a lot of athletes who are like, I like to train in the morning or I like to run in the morning or compete in the morning because then I don't really have to worry about my fueling. And for me, that's just a huge red flag because fueling is something that's supposed to help your performance. And if you can't train or run in the evening there's a problem going on. Like it shouldn't be like this, like you mentioned. Totally. And I mean, for us, like most of the track races are at night. Like I will do 5Ks or 10Ks at 9 or 10 p.m. And that is something where you really have to figure out how to fuel well for it. You know, my morning races, I would say, yes, logistically, those are easier to figure out with fueling. But I think what maybe you're referring to is some athletes who are like, oh, I'm just not going to eat and it's going to be fine. And then I'll eat after my run. Again, with training, like, you know, I leave my house at 8 o'clock, 8.30, and then after all my workout and lift and everything, I don't get home till noon. So if I were to wait till after to eat, that would be, like, half of my day that I'm missing out on fueling. So, yeah, it's definitely not the route to go if you're avoiding fueling before runs just because you're worried about those GI issues. So I know it depends, but I would love to hear or have you walk us through like maybe what a day of eating looks like for you for one of those nighttime races. Like what's your pre-race meal? Like again, a little bit with timing. I know it's very individualized, but I would just love to hear a little bit about that. Totally. So what I do is I work backwards from my race. So if my race is at 9 p.m., I'm going to start my warm up at 8 p.m., So I want to finish eating my pre-run snack maybe at like 6.30. So going from there, I usually try to sleep in, especially for late races, just because, you know, you're nervous. It's a day of nerves definitely make it harder to eat. I want to acknowledge right now that that is a thing and that's normal to be nervous for your race. That's okay, but we still have to find a way to eat. So these are the days where I'm like, it doesn't really matter as much like the nutritional value of your food, right? Like we're trying to get carbs. We're trying to get fuel in. That's okay if that means you're eating four bagels that day. Like if that's all you can tolerate, that's totally fine. That's getting the job done. But typically what I do is I do like a big brunch in the morning. So we'll usually go like to a restaurant, do like eggs, bacon, pancakes, fruit, like big brunch. Um, And then usually we do like a shakeout run in the morning. Then I'll do usually Panera for lunch, just like a pretty simple turkey sandwich. I'll get the baguette bread on the side just for like extra carbs. Usually that's, you know, I don't know, breakfast is like, we'll say at like 9.30, lunch is probably like 12.30, and then I'll usually have like another small meal, like a bagel with peanut butter and a banana around say like 3 o'clock, and then I'll do my pre-run snack around 6 or 6.30, which could be like an oatmeal cup, or I really like those um, Kodiak cake, like muffin in a cup. Those are really great, and I enjoy those. I think that's something else too. Like if you struggle to eat, choking down oatmeal is probably not going to work well. (laughs) It makes me even feel nauseous sometimes, and I'm like, I can't do this. So the Kodiak cake muffin in a cup, like those are good for me. I like, I think they're, they taste good. I enjoy them. So that's usually what I'll do for my, like kind of right before my race. And then I always bring fruit snacks or honey stinger waffle or something just in case I feel hungry before my warm up. Then I'll do my warm up and I typically do something else like a gel before my race. And everybody who listened to that and thought that is so many carbohydrates. I just want to remind you. Yes, it is. The eat more carbs (laughs) podcast. (laughs) <laughs> and that's how many carbohydrates you need mm-hmm. as a professional runner. Lots, lots, yes. But does kind of tie into our next question, which is on your race days, like getting ready for that, like are there specific foods or nutrients that you prioritize? 100% carbs, yeah. I would say I prioritize carbs. I try to get like easy to digest sources of protein like eggs or deli meat, things like that. But I'm not too worried about getting, you know, excess protein. I'm really focused on those carbs. I do try to limit fiber so I don't do like veggies with lunch or anything like that. I really just focus on simple carbs, white bread. I have white bread. I have, you know, nothing like white bagel, nothing with 
too much fiber in there. It's a good thing to highlight is that you're not looking for those things that we traditionally label as like your healthier options, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're gravitating towards the white breads, the easily digestible carbohydrates versus something that is high fiber because it serves a different purpose for you and your goals. Like that's why you're picking those things and it totally works for you and it you have a reason for it. Right. Exactly. Within our private practice, we usually use like the plate modeling, which I know at the professional level, it is a little bit more specific, but I do think that there's fueling focuses that correlate across all of it. So just like you mentioned, race day is not the day to eat a lot of vegetables, but we Mm -hmm. can focus on getting our micronutrients in on our easier runs our rest days, things like that. Do you do any of that type of work with your clients? Definitely. Yeah. So a big thing leading into big races like marathons a few days out, you actually want to start reducing fiber intake. So we work on something, it's called low residue, low fiber, just to help prevent there from being anything in the gut that's kind of like sitting there. Because when you start running, you have something called gut ischemia. So the blood flow moves away from your gut. So anything that's left in there just kind of draws in water and can cause some of those really uncomfortable GI issues while running. So that's something I work on with my clients. I just mentioned to them, like, you know, this is not the time to focus on hitting your servings and fruits and veggies in a day. This is a time to focus on hitting your carbs in a day. And athletes are always shocked. Like I don't really use numbers in my practice, but occasionally we'll kind of talk about general grams of carbs and people are like, what? That's like three times as much as I normally eat. Um, they're always shocked. So the the thing with the fruits and veggies is it does take away from your ability to eat more carbs because they're more filling, they have more fiber. So not only could it cause more GI issues, but it can take away from those nutrients that we really need for performance. So that's usually what I work on. And then for some people too, if it's like a ongoing thing, the nights before workouts, the nights before long runs, we kind of do the same thing. So not worrying too much about the veggies or the fiber, white rice. I actually only eat white rice just because I like it better and I'm running a lot. So I just want to make sure that I'm not having those issues. So things like that are, are things that I do myself and things that I work on with my athletes too. So if somebody's listening, right, and they're a runner and they're like, wow, a lot of this stuff is resonating with them. They're eating salads before their runs. They're thinking they're getting their carbohydrates from fruits or vegetables. What are some like easy first steps to maybe take that step into incorporating some of these easy to digest carbohydrates? Yeah, so I think a common barrier is just misconception around those carbohydrates. So like everyone talks about glycemic index you know, yes, that's a thing, but the glycemic index was done when you eat that food by itself. So like, I'm never just eating white rice alone. I'm having it with chicken, with some veggies, and together that changes the glycemic index of the white rice. So instead of feeling like, oh, these things are gonna, you know, spike my blood sugar or be unhealthy, think about them in terms of how you're eating them and what you're eating them with. And again, thinking about the purpose that they're serving. If you're having chronic GI issues, eating all these salads, you're not going to be able to run your fastest long run or even get through a long run without stopping. And that's going to take away from your goals. So instead of thinking like, oh my gosh, this needs to be healthy. Something I always tell my athletes is that healthy and fueled are not the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive. You can eat healthy and be fueled, but that doesn't mean eating healthy makes you fueled. Um, so trying to remember that like, you know, there's other nutrients, you're always getting nutrients from even like white bread, you know, there's B vitamins in there, there's protein. There is lots of things in those foods that you're eating. So what I do a lot is just kind of break down, okay, what's your hesitation with eating these foods, do some kind of myth busting, and then talk about easy ways to make swaps. So swapping bread for bagels or vice versa, bagels for bread, (laughs) um, is a really easy way to increase your carbs. Like if you do sandwiches or toast at breakfast, doing that with a bagel instead, like doubles your carbs, which is awesome. And it feels about the same. So just little strategies like that, just kind of looking at what you're already doing, thinking about ways that you can just maximize the carb intake a little bit, add juice with breakfast, use flavored yogurt instead of plain yogurt. Um, Simple things like that can just help you get more carbs to support your performance goals. Maddie, you're in Colorado. Yes. In Colorado, you get dehydrated standing outside for five minutes. Mm -hmm especially in Colorado, can you kind of talk us what it looks like to hydrate for like these races like that, especially if like, you know, like you mentioned nerves, jitters, sometimes it's hard to get in food and liquid. What are your tips and strategies for that? Yeah, I would say one of the biggest mistakes I see runners make is they drink more water than they've ever drank in their life the day before the race. 
And not only does that not help you, but it actually is kind of doing the opposite. You're diluting those electrolytes a little too much. And I see this a lot with my high school athletes. They end up collapsing before the finish. They end up in the med tent on an IV and they're like, what happened? I drank so much water. That's why. (laughs) You need to make sure that you are also getting electrolytes. Um, If you train at altitude or in a place that's really hot or humid, if you're a heavy sweater or your sweat leaves a lot of salt on your body, I am all of the above, um, you need more electrolytes. And again, like sodium is something we're kind of taught, like don't get too much sodium. That's dangerous for you. You can lose a thousand milligrams of sodium in an hour of running. And that would be the equivalent of like three noon tablets. And I always tell my high school kids that they're like, what? I drink one. (laughs) Um, So something I do all the time is Element, which is the higher electrolyte drink, LMNT, some people call it. That one works really well for me because it's easy just to get like one serving in and I get everything that I need. Um, Drinking electrolytes before my runs, a lot of athletes drink them after, uh, not a lot think of it beforehand. So that's something I would encourage if you have the time. And then before races, something a lot of runners don't do either is electrolyte load. They think of carb loading, but you can electrolyte load the day before a race, especially if you have a morning race where you won't have time to drink a ton beforehand. Um, And you can do, you know, two to three servings of element the day before, and that really kind of helps you preload. So those are all things that I do. And continuing to do electrolytes as we get into the cooler weather, you still need electrolytes. You're still using them, even if it doesn't feel like you're sweating as much. So you've mentioned sodium, and you also talked about carbohydrates. Both of those are very essential for performance. You've done a little myth busting with those, but I still think that those are two really scary nutrients in our society, Mm -hmm. especially with the running population. Mm -hmm. So how do you educate and encourage others and the running community to prioritize their health and performance over maybe some of the societal pressures that are related to body size and appearance. Totally. That's a really hard one because especially within running, there is this big push to be lighter, to be smaller. That's going to make you faster. And what I always tell athletes is that even if you're, you know, a little bit heavier, but well fueled, you're going to run a lot faster than if you're lighter and under fueled. And yes, you can lose weight really quickly when you reduce your intake, but primarily what that is, is you're losing your water mass, which is, you know, you're dehydrating yourself pretty extremely. And then you're also using up all of your energy stores, which is what your body would be using during your runs. So by doing that, you really are taking away from your performance. You're not helping it. And then with the things like sodium and carbs, you know, I always ask them, like, what are your fears? Where are those coming from? And it's like, oh, my health teacher, you know, told us that sodium is going to cause high blood pressure. You know, there's like 40 different factors that can cause high blood pressure. And yes, sodium is one, but you also have to remember that general population, people living a sedentary lifestyle, their goals, their needs, their considerations are very different from a high performance athlete who's training 10 hours a week, 80 miles a week and using all of those things and then some. So, you know, going over what it really means for them compared to what they've, like the context that they've been told, carbs are bad, sodium is bad. And then again, just kind of reminding them of their goals. We talk about Red S a lot, you know, what are the negative impacts of not fueling enough? And those always outweigh the small positive impact of potentially temporary decrease in weight. I had an athlete actually last week who we looked at her splits and she's eight pounds lighter now than she was a couple months ago working through some red stuff. One of the most eye-opening things to her was she was so much faster when she was eight pounds heavier, Mm -hmm. even though she has more of the look, if we can say now, but her performance is suffering from it. I see that all the time. And like, I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my life and I'm running faster than I ever have in my life. It's not, you know, you have muscle mass, you have fuel stores, you have all these things that contribute to your weight. And again, when we look at performance related factors, weight is one out of 50. And there's all these other things that are contributing to performance that have nothing to do with weight. So that's going to make more of a difference in the long run, pun intended, for people who are feeling well. Exactly. Like, I think you hit the nail on the head there where we have a bad workout and we just are like, or we have a bad run and it's like, it's because of my weight. It's not because 
I didn't sleep last night. I didn't eat last night. Maybe I had alcohol. Like there's so many other factors that can contribute to that poor performance. And in our society, we're so conditioned to be like, it's because of my weight. Yes. I see that a lot. My athletes are like, oh, I made all these fueling changes and I had a really bad workout. It's because I ate too much yesterday. And we talk about their day yesterday. And yeah, they had, they were on their feet for eight hours doing, you know, field work and they forgot to drink water. They forgot to have their snack. They didn't go to bed in time. They woke up. They only got five hours of sleep. They're really stressed. I'm like, you know, these all seem like factors that are going to affect your performance more than having a really big dinner the night before. <laughs> I have to brag about one of my athletes. So she, similar situation, right? Like she was, in, she did, um, she competes in like Iron Men's, Iron Woman. Wow, yeah. We had worked so hard on her racing fuel, all this stuff. She did her race. She completed it. She was trying to get a PR. She didn't get a PR. She was feeling really down. Mm-hmm. A week later, she finds out she was pregnant. Oh my gosh. Which is amazing that oh, she did not invent. Yeah. But... There's so many factors yes. that go into performance and we could be like, wait. And it's like, no, actually, actually <laughs> you're creating life. Like, yeah, <laughs> well, it's amazing. There's again, like, like you mentioned so many factors. Totally. So I know you talked about these a little bit, but we do ask everybody on the podcast, a couple of ending questions. Awesome. Um, so like we said, is the eat more carbs podcast. What's your favorite carbohydrate? Honestly, I think I love croissants and there's a bakery next door to our gym. And so a lot of times when I finish my lift, I'll go get a croissant and have that with my breakfast. And it's like my favorite part of my day. (laughs) So good. So good. (laughs) Love it. What's your favorite pre-workout fuel? I kind of go back and forth between Eggo waffles with maple syrup and toast with butter and jam or like peanut butter and honey. And then what about your favorite post-workout? I don't know if that's the croissant, but what's your favorite? Well, definitely croissants in there, but I would say in terms of like drinks, chocolate milk, I use like the momentous recovery powder, which I really like. I mix it with milk to get more protein and I think it tastes way better than mixing with water. Um, So I do that or I'll do like a big breakfast with, you know, eggs, fruit, pastry or something like that. I love the momentous too because you can travel with them. Yeah, they have those little packs. Those are the best. So great. Um, And then what's your favorite pair of kicks? boots, sandals. We just are always looking for shoe ideas. So we would love to hear what your favorite pair is. Okay. I would say like fun pair. I got these like platform Birkenstocks, which are kind of fun because they're a little bit like more trendy, but like, okay, as a runner, I rarely wear like heels or things like that that are going to hurt my feet or anything. So those are kind of a fun, like in between um, it's a classic Colorado person thing to say, but anyway, I remember you, I remember you worked from our grads program. I so remember you still always... got them. Now I've got platform ones. Um, those are fun. And then running shoes. I really like if you're looking for like a nice, just easy day, general running shoe. Um, the new balance eight eighties are probably my favorite. They're just nice and cushioned and they feel really good on your feet and they last a while. I'm always in the market for a good pair of running shoes. Yeah. So they're the best. Try them out. Yeah. Kind of going over some key topics or key takeaways from our podcast today with Maddie. If you're interested in becoming a competitive runner, sometimes you just need a little bit of competition from a teammate to get you to jumpstart that career to get to varsity. If you're thinking about fueling, especially if you are an endurance athlete, carbohydrates are your friend and make sure you're thinking about carbohydrates leading up to event and practice and then potentially in between practice when we're thinking about specific body size or body type remember that performance at the end of the day does not have a specific size or weight if you are interested in asking maddie questions or finding her on social media maddie what is the best way for people to do that yeah my instagram is at fueling underscore forward and that's probably the best way to reach out you can dm me or anything on there Um, and I can get back in touch with you. Maddie, thank you so, so much for being on the Eat More Carbs podcast today. You're a wealth of knowledge when it comes to running, but also for dietetics as well. If you have questions for Riley and I or questions about this specific podcast, please leave them in the comments below, or you can find us on Instagram. We're at the Eat More Carbs podcast. You can find Riley at Riley Beatty Nutrition, and you can find me at Jenna Fisher Nutrition. Thank you again so much for listening. Please make sure you rate, subscribe, and review, and remember always to eat more carbs.